May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In this moment, to witness is to hold space for the miraculous. Before Christ ascends to the right hand of the creator, he ties up these loose ends, widening the hearts of the disciples so that they truly understand that what they have been given is good news. It's good because grace is guaranteed. It's good because while our sins are inevitable, so is forgiveness. It's good because God is always on the side of the oppressed and it's good because God will always move in ways to free us. It's good because the promise of everlasting love sustains, nourishes, bears fruits with the sweet so flawless that even the honeybees pause. But the disciples aren't just in Bethany to be starstruck. They're not there to take any more notes or to question what's incarnated and breathing. Jesus is here to tie up loose ends and ain't no greenhorn like a doubting Thomas. After months of following the Messiah through miracles, confrontations and trauma, the disciples are now expected to step up and carry Christ's message for generations to come. They are the ones who have been bathed by Christ. They are the ones who have been called away from their nets. The ones who have been exposed in their humanness in the storm on the Sea of Galilee, let's be real, they are imperfect. And it doesn't seem like they've shown Jesus or us that they're up to task. Still, they are joyous. The gospel makes a point of describing that joy of how they were continually in the temple blessing God. This happens despite the fact that Jesus is leaving again. This time he won't be raised from the tomb unscathed. Our faith promises that he'll return at some indeterminate point, but really these are the messengers of God? If there's anything we know about the disciples, it's that they tend to say one thing and then do another. Whether it's Judas's lust for silver or Peter's willingness to deny the savior, these folks don't seem like ideal apostles, but they are indeed divine. And Jesus demands that they share and practice his way even after they've seemingly failed him. It's a gentle reminder of how grace is omnipresent and not very hard to come by. How even when we miss the mark, God guides us home again and again and only asks that we tell the world all about it. I wonder how different our lives would be if we were joyous in our imperfections, knowing that God still believed in us. During the holy season of Lent, I took part in a confirmation class with Dean Amy and Kevin Neal to brush up on what it really means to be a disciple of Christ and more specifically how we live that as Episcopalians. Each week we met to discuss the book Walk in Love by Scott Gunn and Melody Wilson Schaub. And at one point we got stuck on this idea of evangelism. It's, an imp it's important to note here that the chapter on evangelism is at the very end of the book, just like the ascension finalizes Christ's blessing of the apostles. Many of us connected over the church's failure in our own lives. These intense experiences of having to publicly commit to a God that we did not fully understand, who didn't seem to want to love us authentically, and the effects of the pressure in the marketing and sale of the Holy Spirit. You see, evangelism has a bad rep. For too long, it has been tied in with mega churches, prosperity theology, and grave intolerance. It is part of the reason why ministries such as the Crossing and Manna are so necessary and powerful because they challenge that association with the passion of a radical welcome. If you want to know Christ, if you want to know unconditional love, no matter who you are, or where you have been, the good news is that you are joyously welcomed in these spaces. It is the same good news 
given to the disciples on the day of ascension. Thanks be to God. You are witnesses to these things, he says. Stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power on high. Know the disciples aren't in Bethany to be starstruck. They're in Bethany because the training wheels are coming off. They're in Bethany and because they were there, you and I get to share in moments like this. This is the root of evangelism for us. A promise was made to 12 imperfect fishermen. It was kept watered and given enough sunlight. And now we reap the magic of springtime and see God working in all things. Now that, my friends, is some good news. But we cannot deny that while Christ commanded that we abide in his love, as Dean Amy and Molly have reminded us these last few weeks, many of our siblings in Christ have used this platform to sin against those most in need of warmth when they knock at the stroke of midnight, when there is nowhere else to go, when the storm is relentless, when the Pharaoh is angry and when the taverns are full, these are the same people who speak as though they are prophets and who turn away the marginalized and the seeking. I can understand why we wouldn't wanna tell the world about these ugly parts of our faith, but we must. We all know in this Zoom room, on this holy ground, just how harmful such evangelizing rhetoric has been and how antithetical it is to the glory found in Christ's immeasurable adoration. And I do not want to believe that this is what Jesus meant as he ascended into heaven. I'm sure that the disciples, despite the room for growth we see in their previous responses to Jesus's big heart, had every intention of cultivating other messengers with the same commitment to joy and radical welcome. But more often than not, safe passage and warmth has only been offered to those providing the biggest tithes. And for those who have little to give of the material, but an endless supply of compassion, we have been instead met with a fabricated God who is more focused on punishment and atonement than a God who values our transformation and inherent goodness. Those who have evangelized in these ways have done irreparable harm. But God still calls us to the table to start from scratch. We are, are as responsible for their sins as Christ was for ours. Still, the good news is that Christ has anointed us as agents of change and evolution. The good news is that we are committed to setting things right, to opening the sanctuary to the weary and oppressed. The good news is that while our donkeys may be stubborn, they are much more well-fed and cared for than the Roman stallions. Yes, rather than the evangelism that is exclusionary and violent, we can prophesy a vision in which others are inspired by the easiest of our tenets. To be Christ-like, to do what Jesus would have done. We are witnesses to God's grace and deep, passionate love. We, like the disciples at the time of ascension, are undeniably imperfect. We have shunned and sinned and searched for salvation, and by a power so much greater than ours, we have been saved. My friends, the good news can be found in the God who liberates and centers the narratives of people of color while challenging the system seeped in the gospel interpretation of white Protestantism. The good news can be found in the beauty of queer children who will never have to know the inside of a Christian conversion camp. The good news can be found in the cathedral strategic plan and in the redistribution of wealth and resources. The good news is the image of Christ in unhoused peoples and in the breaking of the bread in Stroat Hall every Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. There is so much good news. I could lose my voice over it. One thing I love about having to have worn a mask is that 
No one can see me mouthing the words to every song I blast in transit. I've never been shy about this passion. Along with the entire discography of Fleetwood Mac and Prince, I also have a gospel playlist that consists of everything from U2 to Aretha's famed Amazing Grace album to Sam Cooke's This Little Light of Mine. And having a mask allows me to worship on the 66. It allows me to be prayerful on the green line. But I'm getting too comfortable these days. Sometimes I wish I could carry my tambourine everywhere and jump up with praise as I walk through the Charlie Car terminal. When I'm tapping my foot, I'm not just keeping time. I'm honoring the promise made to 12 imperfect fishermen. And I want to grow hoarse from all the ways in which I love God and how much God loves me in return. My beautiful siblings in Christ, lose your voice. May we be joyous like the disciples, knowing that we too, belovedly flawed, have been gifted the most holy of responsibilities. Let all of God's people say, amen.